Excuse me. Good evening. My name is Carlton Cartwright. I am the executive director for Veterans Memorial and Multicultural Histories Incorporated. Today is um, October the 24th, 2023, and this apparently is a, a Zoom interview. And sir, what is your name? John Ring, J-O-H-N-R-I-N-G, founder of walkforvets.org. Okay, nice. And um, when is your birthday? January 18th, 1979. Okay, and your current address? 525 County Road 2317, Mineola, M-I-N-E-O-L-A, Texas, 75773. Gotcha. All right. Okay. Um, what branch of the service uh, were you in? U.S. Army National Guard. What what year, what year did you enter the service? October October seventh, twenty thirteen. Okay. Um. Why did you choose that branch? I was an old man, <laughs> and uh, old men don't have many choices. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I I choose that. I had a family, and my my kids were young. I always wanted to serve in the military. I come from a strong military background, and. Uh, Something I messed up when I was younger, uh, broke a hand when I was trying to enlist in the Navy. So life went on. So I came back and did it later. Okay. All right. And you have to forgive me. What branch did you say? Now I'm confused. Army or Navy? Army. Uh, but Army. I, I was going to join the Navy when I was young, uh, okay. when, I was, when I was 19. But I joined the Army, Army National Guard. How long were you in the service? Uh, eight years. I uh, ETS October twelfth, uh, two thousand twenty-one. Okay, and um, what rank were you when you separated? E four specialist. Gotcha. All right. Okay. Um, what were you doing prior to going to? Where were you living, and what were you doing prior to going to the to to the military? I lived in Richmond Hill, Georgia. I owned my own business. I also did nuclear security. Okay. Uh, with uh with uh, Plant Vogel in Waynesboro, Georgia. Uh, so um, had you, I'm just curious, had you attended any college prior to the military? I went to Northampton Community College uh, when I, in my earlier years. I uh, did not complete, uh, just short of associates. Gotcha. What did you major in? Uh, business and transportation. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so what, what, would, what were the years that you were in, that you served? It was, uh, 2013 to 2021. Okay. Were you ever in combat? No, sir. Okay. All right. Um, so tell us, um, boot camp. Where did you go to boot camp? Fort Benning, Georgia. How long was it? Go ahead. Uh, I believe it was uh, January to uh, May. Yeah, January to May. It was like five months? Yes, sir. And um, is the, did your boot camp, well, that also included your AIT? Yes, sir. OSIT, one stop. Gotcha. No, but boot camp itself, just basic boot camp, how long was that? Eight, nine weeks, yes, 12 sir. weeks? It it's eight weeks, and then OSIT was four weeks on top of that. Gotcha. What so was that? What was four weeks? I did infantry. I went to infantry oh. school. Okay. And then after that, you went to another school. No, I did basic training. Then I went to infantry school, and then I went to my unit, which oh, was okay. Alpha Company 2121, 48 so Infantry Brigade so Combat Team. What do you remember about basic training? What were your instructors like? What were your peers like? How was the food? Um, <laughs> honestly, I don't remember much about it. Uh, and it was a good time for me because, uh, being older in life, it helped me get back into, uh, the shape I probably should have been when I left. <laughs> and, okay. um, I was probably, I was definitely the oldest one in my company and I was older than all of my drill sergeants except for one and the food, um, uh, wasn't bad. They fed you good. Couldn't complain. 
And how old were you when you did go in finally? Uh, 34 when I enlisted, uh, let's see, 35 when I left and went to uh, basic training. Gotcha. Okay. Now I understand. <laughs> okay. Yep. How old are you now? 44. Got it. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so tech school, how did your instructors treat you in tech school? Was it all good or any, any rough patches with, by the no, way, through basic training and tech school, were there any casualties? Actually, that's I did. We did have a casualty. Uh, we had a uh, a death uh, during um, infantry school. A uh, young man, age of eighteen years old, uh, had a heart condition they didn't know about, and they thought he was a heat cat, and they dunked him in the ice tank, and it sent him to cardiac cardiac arrest, and he died. He was. They thought he was a what? A heat cat. Yeah, heat casualty. They thought he was um, uh, dehydrated, heat stroke. Uh huh. Okay. Wow, that's incredible. Okay. Um. So, where did you say your first duty base was? I served the Alpha Company Two One Two One, the Forty Eighth Infantry Brigade Combat Team in Georgia. And how long were you there? I was light infantry for about three years. Okay. So, that, what was your tour like? What did it consist of? What was your job? Uh, my job was uh, well, various things. I was light infantry. Um, I started out as just in a, in a company, in a platoon. I uh, worked my way up to team leader. And then uh, I realized I was a little too old for light infantry. I got tired of seeing people drive past me when I was walking. Irony in that. Um, and uh, then I switched over to heavy weapons, which was Delta Company 2121. Um, and I did that for three more years and, uh, I had no issues, uh, met some good people, good leaders and, uh, being an older guy in the military, um, uh, it was always like I was, uh, I mean, like a higher rank, you know, I never really, uh, got treated like I was the, uh, you know, at the bottom, you know, I was, right. Yeah, uh, they they respected my common sense. Uh, you can say that word not too often these days, but I mean, reality is, I mean, I I, I was instilled in my ways. Um, the army didn't break me and reshape me. Uh, it actually just educated me more um, and and enhanced that common sense. I guess you would say. Nice. Um, over that three year period, were there any casualties in your? What were you in a, a company, a division, or what? Platoon. Uh, just come. Just company national guard we train monthly and then we would get together and, and train uh you know over the summer there was a few times that we got into uh uh rotations where we would train longer um you know and we'd spend more time in the field but we actually switched um the georgia guard uh the 48th infantry brigade actually rolled into the third infantry division third infantry division it was uh, an experimental uh, thing that they were doing to uh, to include the National Guard into a more active role. And uh, so we, we actually wore the 3rd Infantry Division patch for three years. Did you deploy often? Did you deploy at all? I didn't deploy at all. Uh, I had one canceled. And then when I was walking across the country uh, in 2019 to 20, my company deployed to Afghanistan after uh, I had already left. Gotcha. Okay. I walked across the country uh, while I was still in the military. Okay. We, and we're going to talk about that. It's, um, uh, what, what was your motivation to do that? Why? Uh, so I started, I started working with um, veterans in Chatham County vet court. Um, my, and that my was why you were, this is why you were on active duty, right? I wasn't on active duty. I, I was all reserved. I was national guard. Uh, oh, but I was okay, still in. Right. Yeah, I was still in. I started working with veterans. Uh, a buddy of mine said, "Hey, look, you know, we have a lot of veterans, and I have a, a criminal, uh, a, a, like a background in uh, corrections and nuclear security, and and uh, I was actually a youth mentor at my kid's school. So, I mean, I had a lot of like uh, not 
helping veterans, but just helping people, uh, mm -hmm. whether in civil rights, uh, you know, and things like that. So I, I just had a, like a help me background. I, I like to help people, you know, gotcha. um, started uh, getting involved with the Chatham County Vet Court uh, to kind of see why, you know, a lot of veterans were landing in the criminal justice system. There was a woman there who um, actually uh, she was uh, raped twice, uh, military sexual trauma while she was in the military. Um, she got addicted to opioids when, after an injury she sustained while in training and with that addiction, her husband who also served left her, took her children, uh, switched bases. He went out to uh, Fort bliss and, uh, it kind of sent her into a spiral and then the army discharged her and she left the army with an addiction and, uh, ended up in getting arrested after, many uh, writing false prescriptions and trying to feed that habit. Uh, she got arrested and then she got stuck in the criminal justice system. But in Chatham County, they were blocking her from going to the VA for treatment. And uh, part of the vet court bylaws rules is that if you are 100% disabled or in the VA at all, you're allowed to choose the VA for treatment. And they were blocking her from making that decision. I wow. uh, stood before the judge and the treatment staff and the sheriff's department. And finally, after a few months of arguing back and forth and making enemies, uh, I was able, we were able to get her into the star program into the VA where she failed once, uh, but she went back and did it. And uh, eventually after, uh, you know, struggle and fighting that addiction, she uh, became a physical fitness instructor and now is doing well, uh, has her kids, has her own place and doing great. Uh, but it made me investigate further. Uh, I, I have people that I served with. One of them is walking with me right now. Um, my sergeant, um, just things like seeing, uh, I would say guys that were in service like 16 years that were my age um, being like uh, dominated with the positivity of war, uh, if that makes sense, becoming like a war junkie, mm -hmm. uh, getting so used to it to where it was where we made our money. It was, you know, how we uh, proved ourselves and how we got a higher rank and, you know, got our, our promotion points and all this other stuff. But knowing that when they left that, it was going to be really hard on them uh, because who are you going to fight when there's nobody else to fight? Mm -hmm. And so uh, my buddy, which is out here walking with me, it, it's a valid point. You know, uh, when the war is done and you're no longer needed and you're out of service, who are you fighting with? You're fighting with yourself. You're fighting with your spouse. You're fighting with your kids. Uh, that fight remains inside of you and you have to learn how to get rid of it. And there's just so many different things that, that could be done differently, um, leaving military to the civilian world. And that's a lot of times why we deal with the problems that we deal with is that men and women don't know how to deal with that. They, they leave and they struggle with that uh, and, and coping with that uh, in the civilian world. Okay. All right. Back to this, and I'm sure we're probably going to talk about some more of that. Um, so give me two of your most memorable experiences while you were on that three-year tour. Um, well, I don't know. I, I used to go out to the field and there was a lot of younger kids serving. And at times I kind of felt like dad. Uh, even though we were the same rank, I, I kind of felt like dad. Right. And, you know, I remember um, looking, you know, you, you look at the younger generation right now and they're kind of lost, not all, but, you know, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And they're lost on their own history. Uh, they're, they're lost on who they are, uh, trying to find themselves. And it's taken people a lot longer these days to find themselves. And so uh, I guess some of my memorable moments in serving was actually just having intellectual conversations uh, with, with the younger generation and trying to get them to see things differently. And then also, um, you know, serving with some of these older guys, like, you know, my sergeant's out here walking with me right now and, and trying to have those intellectual conversations, you know, with them a little bit more in depth, uh, you know, about uh, 
you know, trauma and life and, you know, where are you going to be in 10 years? So, I mean, a lot of my, uh, my moments are, are kind of like that. It's more like a team building, you know, like more in depth intellectual conversations rather than, you know, simple stuff. Gotcha. It sounds like you're doing a great, uh, a great service for a community at large. Anyway. Um, so, okay, after, where were you again for the three years? Uh, I was in Alpha Company, uh, 2121, left there, went to Delta Company, 2121, uh, 48th Infantry Brigade Combat Team, 3rd Infantry Division. What state was that in? Georgia. Both, the first one and the second yeah. one? Both in yes, Georgia. Yep. Uh, in the first one, what major city were you near? Were you closest to? Right. I was in Griffin, which is closest to Atlanta. And then the second one was at Valdosta, actually closer to the Georgia Florida line. Gotcha. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so the second one, how long was that tour? About three years. Okay. I was Another... with each one about three years and then uh uh left Delta Company. I was actually going to ETS and get out. The uh, Georgia Army National Guard learned about the walk I was gonna do, and that's when they asked me to extend my contract a year. Well, they actually asked me to extend it for six months, but it turned out to come. It turned out to be a year, and uh, then I had a year of inactive uh, reserve where I just was on standby. But um, yeah, it was six years in uniform, set uh, one year walking across the country, and then one year just on standby in active reserve. Okay, um, was I going to ask you? You said um, okay, so. And the, okay, so wait a minute. The last two years, where were you? The last two years, I was uh, one of them years I was walking across, well, a year and a half of that, I was walking across the country. And then uh, the last six months, I was just at home because I was on inactive reserve. Okay. Meaning I'm just on standby. If we would go to war and they needed me, I would put the uniform back on because they had me for uh, an inactive year of contract. Okay. So over the eight year period, Besides the reserve, did you have a regular job? Oh, yes. What was yes, that? I uh, worked for Norfolk Southern as a train engineer, um, a remote control operator. On, and, trains? Uh, on trains? Yes. Yep. I worked on the main line uh, as a conductor, and then I moved over into an engineer role uh, where I operated the train as a uh, remote control operator. Okay. All right. Um so was your job assignment the same for the whole eight years? Same job? Yep. I was infantry the whole time. Okay. And so tell me about that job that you were doing. In the Army? Uh, yeah. Uh, in, uh, yeah, in the Reserve on the weekends? There yeah, just uh, going there, teaching classes on, uh, you know, basically teaching younger guys how to become older guys and, and learn the infantry. Uh you know, uh, we did a lot. Well, it was mostly classroom. I mean, we'd go out in the field and train and things like that. But, uh, you know, it was just the same old same thing, you know, same thing over and over again, just becoming a better infantryman every single day. Well, you did you work with a lot of ordnance? No, no, sir. No, we just oh. we just infantry just walks and shoots. And that was it. We walk and shoot. <laughs> any uh, any fatalities over the eight eight year period? Anybody get hurt? Injuries in the other at the other two bases? No, sir. Okay, that's good news. That is good news. Okay, so um, the second tour. Give me a couple of things that you'll never forget. Uh, I mean, it's all the same. I mean, it wasn't uh -huh. really a tour. I mean, I was just I switched over to a different company. You know, and just it was a whole new group of guys. It was actually more relaxed uh, than the one I was at before. Uh, a lot of older guys that were there, more uh, set in their ways. Uh, so it wasn't as like intense. I kind of felt it, I, I I felt like I was a part of that one. Like it was like being in a nursing home. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Remember, you're still working on growing old. Be careful with that, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, while you were in the reserve, overall, whether you were on personal R&R &R 
or taking your walks. Um, where did you travel to while you were in the service besides any place that you've already mentioned? Uh, I've been to Fort Polk, Fort Bragg. Uh, I know uh, Bragg is in, in uh, North Carolina. Where's Polk? Louisiana. Okay. Fort Stewart. State? Georgia. Moody Air Force Base, Georgia. Um, Fort Benning. Georgia. Right. Uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Um, was that Paris Island? And that's South Carolina. Okay. Uh, Fort Drum, New York. And what about R&R? &R? Vacations? Oh, family vacations? Yeah, yeah. Where, where did you travel? Oh, oh, I mean, I spent all my time at Hilton Head. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah, yeah most of the time I'd be there. Somebody else just mentioned Hilton Hilton Head to me. Maybe maybe it was Sandra. Uh, okay. Well, anyway. Um. Okay. So, when did you devise? When did you conceptualize this um this walking project? And what is the name of it again? Well, it originated as Buddy Watch Walk. That was the name I originally gave it. It was nothing other than me walking. Uh, and, and what happens on these walks? Go ahead. Well, uh, I first started it on October 1st, 2019. I had a plan that I wanted to help veterans in a larger capacity, but not just help veterans. I wanted to understand. I wanted to put in perspective where the struggle was coming from. And so um, in three weeks, I went from selling all my stuff and uh, making sure my youngest son and my ex-wife were good uh, to uh, launching this walk across the country. And I actually reached out to people that had done it already. I searched them. I found them by name and I wanted to, to find out where, you know, like they thought they could have done better. And uh, a lot of them were very open minded to, to telling me, you know, like, hey, a lot of them were older guys. They, they didn't hit social media enough. And so that was my focus. And having, you know, a marketing background uh, in, in the political world, um, I basically marketed myself and the walk to try to help people, you know, more in depth. And. So, yeah, so it started out as me walking. I had friends come out. I had congressmen come out. I uh, left Tybee Island, Georgia on October 1st, and I just wandered into the unknown. Um, I uh, walked Highway 80, and uh, I, I just – I would stop in uh, American Legions and, and VFWs and uh, just – meet people, talk to veterans, you know, and, and some of them, a lot of them opened up, you know, you really be, so I would meet people and, um, you know, talk with them about their, you know, service, whether it was Vietnam veteran, Korean veteran, uh, World War II veterans, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, we would sit there and we would talk, you know, about their service and the disconnect if there was one, you know, some, a lot of veterans feel that, you know, the system's great. They had no issues whatsoever. A lot of veterans have the struggle. They have the uh, the struggle, um, you know, with um, dealing with their service. So hearing all those stories and, and just putting things in perspective, uh, I was able to take multiple stories from multiple different veterans and like meet veterans that were struggling and connect the dots and help them because I would listen to this guy who went through the same thing mm -hmm. and so basically i was just relaying other people's stories to other veterans and giving them solutions and it, it just turned into like a whole like a wave of um just getting to know people and and helping them and then like meeting with organizations and connecting organizations uh people would come out and walk with me uh they would they would uh uh, sorry, I have a person that keeps calling me and it keeps cutting in. Um, okay. But it's okay. So like I would just try, they would come out and walk with me and it gave you time to get to know somebody, you know, like 
when we just engage with each other on a regular basis, you're kind of in passing and you don't really have that time walking. You have the time to connect with the person that's with you. Uh, you have that, uh, that freedom to get to know somebody. Uh -huh. And for me, it was just, uh, it was a great way to connect with people. And I saw as I was doing this, that, um, uh, it was working. I had a gentleman uh, with the name of Jimmy Matthews. Uh, he's a retired master sergeant, 25 years in the army. Uh, I believe seven deployments. Um, he retired and 10 late and 10 days later, he was out walking with me and he said that he wanted to walk across the state of Mississippi and he came out, walk with me for a few days. And he's like, I'm going all the way with you. I want to, I want to see what this is about. Wow. And so he walked from, uh, Pearl, Mississippi to California with me. Mm -hmm. uh, I had two other veterans come out. One was Jason Hanner. He's a United States Navy veteran, met me in Edgewood, Texas on January 13th, 2020, walked to uh, Dallas with us and then came back out in El Paso and walked to California with us. Um, Eli Hawkins, he was, I served with Jimmy met us in Tucson and walked to California. So we ended, what ended up started out as me just doing it turned into four guys completing it in California. And it was a roller coaster. I mean, it, it was a lot of support, but then there was also moments where, you know, we were walking on the interstate and you're not really supposed to walk on the interstate, but I had the philosophy like, look, you know, veterans are ignored and suffer all the time. So I'm going to do this to get people's attention. You know, I want to get people's attention and I did get people's attention. And there was only a few instances where that became iffy. Um, but for the most part, it was very, I would never be able to do that again. Uh, that first walk would never be able to be repeated. It was, I felt like I was in the right place at the right time, every step of the way. And so what started out as one walk that was 2,462 miles turned into a second walk. And then it turned into uh, a 2.2 mile walks in 22 states and 22 consecutive days. And then it turned into what we're doing now, 4,150 miles from Key West to Forks, Washington. Um, why did you why did you leave the reserve? <laughs> well, uh, one, as I was walking, I, I really did learn that the military is really um a big part of the responsibility and a big part of the problem of why veterans are the way they are. Um, not always, but um, I feel it my opinion that a lot more can be done to help a service member uh, that's struggling. Oftentimes you'll see them just kind of get pushed out the door and uh, they don't want to deal with it. And then it becomes the VA's problem. And the VA does not nearly have the money that, you know, a military budget does. And so you, you see that struggle. Um, and so I left because one, I didn't, I didn't want to see that anymore, but um, it gets a little bit more in depth than that is where what started out as the military supporting my mission for walking across the country, it turned into them wanting to control the mission. Um, I, I had uh, leaders uh, reaching out to me, uh, trying to get me to uh, stop the walk and come back uh, for for medical stuff. And I said, look, I said, if you come get me, I'll gladly come back, but I don't have a car. I'm walking across the country like I can't just stop what I'm doing. And, you know, um, but it was all it, it was it wasn't. The contract said one thing. And I went by what the contract said. Let's just put it that way. The contract said one thing. I went by what the contract said. And they were trying to manipulate that and change it. Um, my message started changing, and they didn't like that. I started talking more about veteran suicide. I started talking more about service members that were struggling and uh, putting that out on social media. And I think at some point, they they didn't want to hear that no more and it shifted and then they tried to pull me back in and i was already in like it wasn't happening so nothing came out of it uh bad uh i was honorably discharged 
it was just that it, it seemed there was really no support there. Uh, what started out as the National Guard of Georgia saying, we're going to support you all the way across the country. We're going to let everybody know what it is that you're doing in every state that you're walking through turned into nothing. Hmm. So why that happened, it's way above my pay grade. But um, the point is, I did what I set out to do. Um and, you know, I, I got into a few arguments with some leaders uh, along the way. Um, but at the end of the day, I was honorably discharged. Thanks for my service and bye bye. <laughs> OK. Um, the closer that you got to retirement. Oh, do you have any medal citations? Uh, no, nothing, from, nothing from overseas. Um, just basic Army stuff. Um, just from serving and um i was never a, i've never been um a bearer not aware i guess you would say um you know i i never really i never really cared about that you know the young guys knocking out like 300 and three three hundred thousand pt scores just to get you know something special i mean I, i'm I did my job. I was an old guy. Like I, I fulfilled when I graduated basic training and I graduated infantry school, I surpassed what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to wear the uniform. I wanted to uh, serve my country. And that was, that was that, you know, gotcha. I educated myself because I had kids that follow. I have a son that served uh, four years in the army. He deployed to Iraq, and I have a young son that's seventeen who's about getting ready to enlist right now. So, really? okay. I wanted to I wanted to be a dad that could talk to them and give them uh, experience based on my actions, not somebody else's words. Speaking of family, um, the entire time that you went on active duty, did you ever have a problem staying in touch with your family? So I wasn't ever on active duty or any extended time except for training and, and, you know, you well, know, every, every year. That's but okay. what, what was that question about the family again? So you did weekends, right. And you did two weeks a year, every year, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So when you were on those, when you were doing your reserve duty, right. Did you ever have a problem, <clears throat> excuse me, staying in touch with your family? Oh, no, sir. No, uh, never okay. had, never had an issue with that. All right. Um, remind me again, what year did you say you, you got out of the service? Uh, 2021, sir. Got you. Did you have all, while you were on um, active duty, did you have all the supplies that you needed to do the job that you had to do? I'm sorry. I, I, I had people loud in the background. That's okay. What I'm trying to ask you is, anytime you were doing your two week, your, your, your weekends or your, you know, your two weeks, um, did you have all of the supplies that you needed? Did you have everything that you needed? To oh, do your yes, job? sir. Okay. Good. Yes, sir. Right. Just a few more questions. Um, oh, you're fine. Okay, good. All right. So, um, we did that. Hi, overall, what did you think of, um, officers and your fellow enlisted? <laughs> uh fellow enlisted you know um being older going in and and having the common sense um sometimes i wondered uh sometimes i i saw that struggle but uh mostly it was in the 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 junior officers your lieutenants you know um i've never really been a uh, firm I've never been a big supporter of OTA uh, officer training. Uh, OTA, uh, you got it. Officer, officer training, training school. school. Yeah. yeah, officer cannon school. I've never been a really big uh, supporter of that because even serving, you know, I would have a lieutenant that got a degree in horticulture, and now he's leading a infantry company seven miles in the wrong direction, and we would have to walk seven miles back. You know, um, I, I do believe that. If you put me in charge for one day, uh, other than going to ROTC, everybody else would have to be enlisted first and then go uh, before a board appears uh, that were officers and enlisted uh, to, to get that to get that status. I, I am a firm believer in that uh, something that needs to be earned. But um, having a son that's 
17 that's wanting to go to the Citadel uh, next year, who wants to enlist first to get that respect. Um, yeah, I'm definitely a firm believer in that. But, I, you know, other than that last year when, you know, I was walking across the country uh, and, and dealing with some undesirable uh, uh, behavior, uh, other than that, no, I never had any issues whatsoever. Um, everybody treated me with respect. I, you know, I, I'm old school. You treat me with respect. I'll treat you with respect. I mean, it was the same way in the military. So no, nah, I mean, nothing out of the ordinary. Did you use your GI bill for anything? Uh, yes. I used my GI bill when I was, um, uh, in, uh, railroad when I wasn't going through the railroad school, mm -hmm. um, I used it for that. It was like a supplemental um, payment for training. Okay. Okay. Um, cool. Did you finish, by the way, did you finish your college at all? I have not finished my college yet. Okay. It is actually something on my bucket list that I am going to do. Uh, I actually planned on doing it while I was walking this time, and I still might, but I'm not sure. It just depends on um, how st structured and how, how this walk goes. We're just basically starting out. Okay. Did, did, um, oh, did you make any close friendships while you were in the military? Oh, uh, yes. I made a few friendships, a couple of my sergeants. One of them's out walking with me right now. And the other one has walked with me, uh, in the past. I have about a good, uh, five people that I serve with that I'm, I'm really good, you know, close with today. So you said you got out of service in 1991, correct? Nope. No, nope. I got out of the service in 2021. 2021. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, so, okay, that was, that was three years ago. What did you do immediately when you got out? You knew what you were going to do, didn't you? Yeah, I walked across the country. Right. I, I, okay. was, I kept walking. Um, I, I, still, I still walk. I mean, it's is, been... Is, is that your career the, right now? Uh, so I own a uh, news agency in Texas okay. uh, that I started from the ground up back in uh, 2020, mm -hmm. and uh, I own a marketing business uh, that's nationwide that I do all my own marketing for my news agency, and I do all my own marketing for the walks that we do, uh, and then I have clients in various locations of the in the country that um, you know that I work for and do work for. Okay, you said so. You have your own marketing agency. Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Congratulations. Thank you. Then, um, and you're still doing that now, correct? Yes, sir. I do it out here on the walk. I have right. clients that I work for every single day. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Um, did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Uh, yes. I mean, it really did. Uh, you know, just meeting people and talking with people that had deployed multiple times over. Um, it really and, and one of the things that it helped shape me is that we actually deploy people too much now. Uh, we really do. Uh, having somebody like Jimmy walk with me, a buddy of mine named Josh. I mean, they both deployed seven times. I really think that's excessive. Uh, what are we doing to people when we're putting them into that kind of uh, lifestyle? Whether they're uh, seeing deployment, uh, seeing combat directly or not, it's the fear of when I do go out on a patrol, what's going to happen? It's every single day. And so seeing that and hearing their stories, uh, it did really help shape my um, my my opinion of war um, that, you know, some people think it's a good thing. I mean, I really hate to say that there, there's people that serve that really thrive on war. They they thrive on what they feel they get out of it, but they're not really putting the pieces together of what's going to happen later. And I think that is something the military can do a whole lot better job of managing. Uh, we really fail there. Um, we'll gladly send somebody on seven deployments, but, you know, the military is not really, you know, what are we doing to that person? on those seven deployments so i really think like moving forward that's something that needs to be addressed where you know maybe we're only sending somebody on three deployments and they're kind of that old universal soldier now where they're not going anywhere but they're training younger people um but we have to really stop being beating up the mental mind of of 
people that serve in the military. Wow. Okay. Um, how did your service and experiences affect your life? Huh. Well, you know, I, um, I've been all over the country and, you know, th this comes from after, or actually, you know, I was still serving when I walked the first time, the whole time, but I saw like, I, I remember speaking to like Vietnam veterans and um, there was so much difference between like all Vietnam veterans were treated horribly and most of them. And I would see like just the difference. And th this is where like civil rights and, and, and race comes into it that, you know, white Vietnam veterans were being spit on. But then, you know, you had uh, black Vietnam veterans that were being spit on for two reasons, mm -hmm. you know, and it it really hurt, you know, to, to sit. I sat with two gentlemen that were Vietnam veterans. One was a white guy, one was a black guy, and they were both from two different locations. And the stories that they told me, it was like, it was hard, disheartening, like, you know, just the, just hearing that. You know, and it, it does reshape if you're if you're an intellectual person and you have any empathy hearing something like that, it, it does reshape you. You know, you you look at things differently. I um, to add on to that. One of the most. One of the most uh, things that stand out to me uh, in all of my miles walked and everything like that is Selma, Alabama. Um, I've walked over the Edmund Pettus Bridge now four times. Um, I keep going back. And the reason I did, uh, the first time I went there, I had never been to Selma. I was walking west on that, that walk across the country. And I get to Selma and I met a gentleman who was on um, the uh, the east side of uh, the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And he was cleaning up the monuments. And, he, uh, you know, I talked to him and he was telling me about how his uncle, you know, was there on Bloody Sunday and told me about, you know, the stories that he told him. And we walked over the bridge together. And it just like, it, it really hit me deep. You know, I knew about it already. I had already worked with uh, great people like Andrew Young and John Lewis and uh, in, in a, a political realm. Um, but just hearing that from that gentleman, it kind of like, it grabbed me. And so when I was done with the walk, uh, we had uh, went the opposite direction back to Tybee Island, Georgia. So we got to the Edmund Pettus Bridge again. And uh, a gentleman who is now deceased, uh, he was the American Legion post commander at the time. He organized this, uh, another walk and, you know, he wanted the bridge shut down, but it wasn't. And uh, it was like only the white community came out. And I was like, okay, this is just like, I'm not accepting this. So we, we did the walk. I went back. I went back again. And uh, the, the third time I went back, only the black community came out. Like I couldn't get like, you know, everybody just to support this, you know? And so I'm like, all right, you know what? I'm doing it again. I'm, I'm going back one more time. So uh, actually last year, um, there's a dear friend of mine. Her name is uh, Mrs. Patricia Barbie. She is, uh, her husband uh, was Sergeant John Barbie, United States Marine Corps. He was killed in action in Vietnam on August 6, 1968. And I check on her all the time. You know, I love her like a mom, you know, and um, I, I wanted to always do something sweet for her. Uh, because she's been a sweetheart to me and always supported my missions walking and uh, knows my kids and everything. She's a great, amazing woman. And uh, so I, I picked her up and I uh, drove her to Selma, Alabama, because uh, her late husband, uh, Mr. Barbie, was a foot soldier for Dr. King. And he was a pastor in Nashville who got ran out of Nashville um, by the KKK. And uh, he always wanted to go to Selma, but he never did. And uh, Reverend Orange, uh, he actually worked under Reverend Orange. And so uh, I took Mrs. Barbie to Selma, Alabama, where a lot of our walk family uh, gathered, and we shut down the bridge. 
uh, we shut it down, and Mrs. Barbie walked over the bridge with her husband's burial flag, and um, there was no color there that day. Hmm. Everybody was there, and huh. seeing that, uh, it it satisfied me. Uh, it it was it was exactly what I had been looking for every single time I was there, and um, yeah. That to me has probably been like one of the most, it was probably like one of the most best days of my life gotcha. other than my kids being born. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, at this time, I want to thank you for uh, a great interview. And I thank also you. want to thank you for your service. Um, but I also would like to know if there's anything else that you'd like to share. I just want to share that if you're a veteran or if you're a family member of a veteran and you're struggling for whatever reason, reach out for help. There are people all over this country that will help you. Um, unfortunately, it just takes a little bit of work to find the, the right ones that really do care and, and want to see you uh, be better. So that's the message I, I, I share to everybody. I echo it. Before I let you go, um, from the story that you just told, I feel like you've had an experience um, that you have experienced. You've now you've accumulated, cultivated experience uh, on on the issue that's very specific to what you've been carrying out as far as this walk is concerned. So, what I'd like to ask you is, what is your how do you feel about how mental health is being handled in this country today? Oh, we are failing like there is no tomorrow. You know, we create people that want to, we, we tell people that they, they, they don't need to be weak. Uh, they don't need to say they have a problem. And uh, the reality is most people have problems. Uh, we all have problems and uh, either you address them or you don't. Uh, when you don't is when we start seeing the decline and then we start seeing the medication and then we start seeing the decline even more because medication is not the answer. It can be the the, the beginning part of that treatment, but it cannot be the forever. Right. And so um, some of the veterans I've met, Vietnam era veterans that have like boxes full of medication from the VA, um, it, it's horrible. And, you know, a lot of times they just need somebody to talk to. Mm -hmm. They just need somebody that wants to be uh, their friend. They want to listen. They want to understand. And it takes me right back to the walks. I mean, I know I can't have a Vietnam veteran come out and walk 20 miles with us, but I will walk a mile with you that day at whatever pace you want to walk to make sure that you're a part of it in some way, shape or form. And mm -hmm. that's the difference. That's what the walks do. I really feel like, yes, we, we are failing as a society, as a country and in, in mental health. And if we don't do something about it, it it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It was really good. Thank you, sir.